And we're back. The real life tale behind Wolfman begins with a chance encounter. Producer Leslie Stride was a frequent late evening rambler of North London's more forested heaths. In unpublished memoirs, Mr Stride recounts one night strolling through Hampstead by the light of a full moon when he came upon a rather hairy gentleman in the bracken. The man in question was shirtless and appeared to be wrestling with another much younger man over some undisclosed disagreement. According to Leslie, he naturally felt the need to intervene and, in his own words, quickly beat off the hairy assailant. Stride then introduced himself to the younger man wiping himself down, who turned out to be none other than aspiring playwright Ernest Flack. Ernie grew up on a cinematic diet of silver screen scares from across the pond. And with his career in avant-garde nudist theatre going nowhere, the writer was soon penning the first draft of a monstrous screenplay for his new associate. Thus, the dastardly villains of Anvil took on a new supernatural slant. Stride wrote himself that he was keen to present a man in turmoil with his own savage nocturnal instincts. We could only ponder as to why this idea was so prevalent in his mind. The executives, however, were in need of some convincing. The bigwigs of the day were reluctant to fund a film they considered a low-brow furry scream fest, as one unimaginative honcho referred to the proposed picture. For the benefit of listeners, Warren did in fact use the air quote hand gesture when reciting the words low-brow furry scream fest. And I just did the same. Mm. Flack's original title was A Wolf in Paris and was purportedly the tale of a forbidden romance between a bishop of Notre Dame and a gypsy who just happens to be cursed with lycanthropy. Which we believe is the Latin for werewolfism, though that is unsubstantiated. Producer Leslie Stride argued the film could be shot by reusing sets already built for upcoming productions. Uh, these included Parisian streets and sewers from Murder at the Moulin Rouge and church interiors from Hell's Bells. But them who held the purse strings were having none of it. Yet Mr Stride was not about to take it lying down or even sitting, not even in a favourite armchair, perhaps the purple velour piece he purloined from the set of Enter the Queen. He was going to make this film regardless, even if it killed him. Excellent foreshadowing, Warren. Oh, you're very welcome. Stride privately began to scout potential directors and actors for his project by leaving copies of the script in various bathhouses throughout the city. First to be cast was the leading lady, Patricia Akehurst, who was considered ideal for the role by virtue of her being the most readily available at the time. A regional rep theatre girl, Miss Akehurst was new to London and very keen. By now, the role had undergone its very own transformation and the gypsy girl had been converted to a nun in the guise of Sister Christa Valiente. A continental Christian pilgrim of vague origins. Unfortunately... Miss Akers clearly struggled to mask her thick East Midlands twang in her performance. As we can hear in this brief audio clip from the final cut of the movie, recovered from a tape found in a tumble dryer in Lytham St Anne's in 1987. Give it a little listen and see if you can spot her accent slip in this scene. But my dear sister Christa, have you not yet made the acquaintance of the beguiling Baronet Levitt? Sister? You are related, I take it? Not even slightly, Creighton. Krista here is a sister of the Order of Our Blessed Lady of... Why, you have travelled very far. He is more than 40 hours by horse. And even longer by stag, which we all know are native to... Have you been to England before, sister? I've never set foot in this ancient country in my life. 